Welcome to Med Evidence, where we help you navigate the truth behind medical research with unbiased, evidence proven facts. Powered by Encore Research Group and hosted by cardiologist and top medical researcher, Dr. Michael Corrin. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Corrin, moderating an episode of Med Evidence that involves Dr. Steve Tengis and our talk about headaches and migraines in particular. Mm -hmm. And this is our third discussion, third session. And we want to talk about research now. We are research guys. We've been doing this for a long time. You've been very involved here at our research center in Jacksonville, Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to know what the latest and greatest is and some of the concepts that are being considered to help people with headaches, particularly migraine headaches, which is a huge source of lo lost productivity and disability. So... Um, we had some interesting discussions in, last, uh, in the last session, and including the use of Botox mm -hmm. for headaches, and mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. we actually have a clinical trial that's looking at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also talked about the groups of patients that are just not getting where they need to get with current therapeutic modalities. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can start the conversation by telling us the group of patients that are not getting where they need to get despite some of the advances we've already made. Well, certainly, um, you know, our headache clinics have patients that we we were were having on having trouble, uh, you know, getting their headaches under under control. Um, you know, I that's relatively uncommon uh, with the uh, mixture of uh, therapeutic options that are available. Um, we generally eventually are, are very likely to get someone's headache center under control, whether that be a mixture of things. Um, uh, but it, it, it usually happens, but there's still patients, uh, that we are, we are, we're not sufficiently successful with. And so there are more, um, there are more things to consider, mm. uh, with, uh, development of new therapeutics. Uh, there are novel, uh, approaches that I think, uh, you know, it'll be, it'll be very helpful to see, um, you know, some of the things that, that are kind of in the pipeline, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, have demonstrated efficacy and safety, right. uh, through the process of clinical, uh, trials right. and then up become additional options. Now you mentioned in the last segment that the class of CGRP mm -hmm. Antagonists, uh, mm -hmm. calcitonin gene related peptide, I think is the mm -hmm. the acronym, mm -hmm. are successful up to fifty to seventy percent in terms of preventing migraine headaches, which would infer to me that there's still a thirty to fifty percent rate of migraine headaches in some patients. Yeah, are there any special characteristics of those people that don't seem to respond to CGRP antagonists? Uh, no, I, I don't think we can really predict that. Uh, right now. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe uh, in the future, if there are some pharmacogenomic uh, type studies that uh, investigate these sorts of things, and there are some uh, early studies, not, I'm not aware of any with, with CGRP based drugs, but other therapies, uh, they, they, uh, they, there are some pharmacogenomic uh, information that we can, uh, in the future, uh, perhaps uh, may be able to use. But no, it's, it is, it is a, it is a trial. Hmm and error thing. Um, this calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP, is something that uh, is um, very central to a lot of what goes on in our, our, our brain with the uh, disorder of migraine. Um, it, is, it is a neuropeptide that exists in all of the uh, C uh, fiber or pain fibers that are uh, throughout our body. Uh, and, and those very heavily innervate our meninges mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and lining the, of the brain, lining of the brain. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that the process kicks off a, a strong CGRP release out at the level of our meninges that then mm -hmm. stimulates uh, the trigeminal uh, sensory uh, innervation that is uh, alongside to really kick off a lot of what happens in a migraine, the, the dilation of the vasculature, uh, the, the, this, this is what's responsible largely for the neurogenic inflammation mm -hmm. uh, and, and likely uh, even uh, breakdown in some uh, vascular permeability uh, and mast cell degranulation, all happening uh, largely at the level of our meninges kicked off by mm -hmm. more uh, and then stimulating more central uh, you know, pain pathways. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, just to get into that a little bit more, particularly mm -hmm. from my standpoint as a cardiologist, so this has to do with intracellular calcium regulation. 
It will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, calcium channel blockers do work to some degree for migraines. Is there any relationship between calcium channel blocker success and CRGP excess? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. And, and so we, we will have, you know, some of the calcium channel blockers would be in the category in the previous section we mm-hmm. referred to as oldies but goodies right. that are also cheapies. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Uh, and so, and there, there actually are some uh, pharmacogenomic uh, data, particularly with Verapa mill mm-hmm. uh, you know that sort of stuff is is uh, in terms of predicting uh, the likelihood of a response to verapamil um, and uh, th- that's not really ready for prime time in a, in a, in a clinic uh, but those sorts of research uh, um, inf- uh, data are, are extremely interesting and, and probably will uh, in part be kind of the future of, mm-hmm. of, of a headache uh, practice I, I believe eventually mm-hmm. um, um, so it would be nice to be able to predict what you will respond to and what you will mm-hmm. likely have side effects to. But we're not that good at We're that. not that good yet. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what we like to do in med evidence is talk about what we know, yes. what we don't know, yes. and how we're going to learn about what we don't know. Yes. So one of the things we don't know is predicting who's going to respond to which category of drugs. Correct. Okay. Yes. So let's get to one of the categories, a Botox. Okay. So Botox is not thought of necessarily as a headache drug. Okay. But it works, doesn't it? It sure does. Um, it's one of our most effective uh, treatments, f- specifically or c- currently it's FDA approved for chronic migraine patients. Mm-hmm. Um, chronic migraine patients being patients that have headaches on more days than they don't have headaches. Wow. And at least eight of them in a month become migraineous. That's really what we mean by chronic migraine, mm-hmm. uh, as long as that's gone on for uh, a duration of at least several months. Um, now we say Botox and everybody knows the name Botox, but Botox is a trade name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's onobotulinum toxin A is sort of the the, the name of what Botox Easy is. Easy to say Botox. <laughs> it, it is. Once you practice onobotulinum toxin A a few times, you can kind of get it to come out. And so there are numerous botulinum toxins, uh, and Botox or onobotulinum toxin A is the one that's FDA approved for chronic migraine. Um, and there are other uh, toxins that have different FDA approvals. And one of the studies that, uh, you know, uh, uh, will be entered into is a different uh, botulinum toxin uh, and and addressing uh, specifically uh, both episodic and and chronic migraine patients and so that's that's very exciting hmm. uh, I think as a as a, a potential option uh, and a new uh, botulinum toxin uh, therapy that may may demonstrate efficacy safety and and hopefully if so then be FDA approved okay yeah so um now, I call it botulism toxin. Does it okay. really matter if you pronounce it that way or botulinum? <laughs> I think everybody knows what you're talking about. Okay. Um, it, is a, it is a therapy that uh, is seemingly fairly unconventional. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it, do you inject it in the, in the forehead area? Tell us a little bit more about the details. It is a procedure. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, the, really, the... the protocol for it are we would we would call preempt just named after the studies the clinical studies that demonstrated its efficacy uh, very specific mm-hmm. uh, you know location and doses of, of injections there's actually 31 injection sites mm-hmm. uh, in the in the preempt protocol um, and and generally certainly in the clinic uh, kind of that's the way that's way the way that we start mm-hmm. um, it is a protocol that's been uh, validated through the mm-hmm. years and adjusted uh, and uh, in it, it it is um, one of our most useful uh, go-to therapies mm. for the really challenging uh, migraine patient um, botulinum toxin is taken up uh, by uh, sensory neurons mm. uh, and we believe that it's taken into our brain stem mm. uh, actually and one of the things that it does is it paralyzes the ability of uh, trigeminal uh, mm. innervation to release CGRP uh, and other therapies, uh, other neuropeptides, but uh, it, one of its uh, likely main mechanisms of action is is um, paralyzing the ability to release that CGRP substance out right. in our meninges. And, and, and just for the, for the lay audience, trigeminal is the nerve that affects the eyes and the face. And, and, and is responsible for all of the sensory innervation of the lining of our brain or the meninges. Right. Yes. So, so how does the the protocol differ when you're using botulism or botulism, however you pronounce it, a toxin 
uh, for cosmetic pur purposes versus neurological purposes. <clears throat> so, well, botulinum toxins are uh, will are capable of influencing sensory neurons the way that the way that I just mentioned, but they also weaken uh, muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, they they uh, prevent uh, uh, motor neurons from being capable of stimulating a muscle, so it can contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a, a a way that you can get rid of a wrinkle. Mm -hmm. uh, is you can uh, weaken the muscles that are producing those wrinkles. Gotcha. Uh, and that has been something that has been, you know, known and done for a very long period of time. And, and the observation was made uh, with a plastic uh, surgeon who was doing cosmetic uh, botulinum toxin injections and realized, uh, you know, while one in one in five females is a is a migraine patient, a pretty consistent report that uh, you know, hey, you know, with this with this cosmetic stuff, my migraines are really getting better. Interesting. And then, lo and behold, here come uh, the the studies in migraine with with demonstrated. And the efficacy. protocols are the same for the different indications. Uh, no, the doses are going to be much higher for migraine. Okay. Uh, and so that's an important point. Um, you know, when when we're doing uh, cosmetic, well, we don't do cosmetic um, uh, injections, but when when cosmetic inject injections are being done, they're done in different locations and generally at a much lower dose mm -hmm. uh, than what we are using for uh, migraine treatments. Mm. Is it a problem that people that get prescribed the toxin for neurological purposes use it off-label for other things? Is that an abuse um, of the... I, uh, of the therapy, we discourage that, mm -hmm. um, and the main reason uh, that one of the main reasons to discourage that is we need to understand that this is a toxin that that it is possible for our immune system to respond to, mm -hmm. uh, and so we could uh, develop antibodies to uh, onobotulinum toxin A or any other botulinum toxin, and if our immune system really responds to it and develops um, high uh, concentrations of antibodies to it, that therapy is not going to work for us because our immune system will gobble uh, it up as soon, uh, right. as, as soon as we inject it. So undermine and, your own purposes. Correct. And <laughs> so the protocol of injection every 12 weeks mm -hmm. uh, seems to work well at reducing the likelihood of development of, of anti-toxin uh, antibodies. Mm -hmm. And mixing that up uh, really does run the risk of, of stimulating our immune system mm -hmm. and, and backfiring on the patient. And so the botulinum Toxin has a lot of of utilities, mm -hmm. and um, you know there are patients that require it for uh, bladder issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there are heart related studies with botulinum toxin. If there is another indication, or a person is doing cosmetic injections along with migraine based injections, we just really strongly encourage them to have those done pretty much on the same day or mm -hmm. within a day of gotcha. each other. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So let's move to another area of research. So okay. what, what else is going on in terms of, of treatment for refractory patients that have migraines or other headache syndromes? It it is. I think it is part of um, part of what we will share with patients who are, you know, one of the most difficult things is is when the patient gets uh, uh, defeated and feel mm. and, and has a loss of hope. Um, you know, there are other novel um, uh, compounds, um, uh, PACAP or uh, pituitary adenylate uh, cyclase protein um, that that seems to potentially maybe have some significant uh, in, uh, pathophysiologic relevance to migraine and it is a completely uh, novel uh, mm. uh, therapeutic that um, um, we've participated in in some of those trials here and there there are more um, with with various uh, pharmaceuticals planned for the future and so that's a completely unique mm. uh, mechanism of, of treatment that may uh, come uh, come around the bin um, hopefully it will be nothing uh, on the market yet oh no no mm. no 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 pay cap inhibitors on uh, FDA approved at this time mm -hmm. um, and then <clears throat> in in terms of uh, um, relatively uh, unique, uh, I think is one of the studies that we'll be participating with with uh, with a therapy uh, that impacts uh, uh, prostaglandin uh, mm -hmm. pathways. Uh, prostaglandins are a very important part of inflammation and pain, uh, uh, and and can influence uh, vascular uh, you know tone as sure. well. Uh, and so there are uh, novel um, uh, prostaglandin-based uh, preventive therapies that, that we'll also be studying uh, here in the near future. And so the general message 
for the the migraine sufferer who has uh, not had a, a, a sufficient response uh, to um, a variety of therapies is to understand that the research world is inventing uh, and continues to uh, address and, and try to come up with new strategies for those patients that that we've not been uh, that successful with in the past. Sure. Yeah. So you're a clinical trial guy, so and you see lots of these patients, so. When do you approach a patient about getting involved in clinical research? Um, obviously, I would think that somebody that has a great response to something that's already out there is probably not going to be the best candidate. On the other hand, it sounds like there are people that go through your headache clinic that would be great candidates. So give us a little insight into how you approach that and, and why you would uh, – choose a particular type of patient for this discussion? You know, there there seems to be uh, a, a, a personality type that's interested in investigation uh, and, uh, you know, patients who uh, understand um, the landscape of, of treatments, uh, then, um, you know, um, pointing out to them that there are uh, newer treatments that, you know, uh, just like all of our CGRP-based therapies, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago, they were all in the in in, in clinical trials. Uh, and, and we saw we saw plenty of people during the development of those drugs that got huge benefit. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, even though yes. a lot of these studies are placebo controlled, sometimes there's an open label portion of the trial where everybody gets access to it. But it's obvious in some cases who's getting the therapy and who's not. Quite it, frankly, it, it, it is. Yeah, especially uh, in something symptomatic. Correct. Right. One, one of the things that's um, uh, true about and and a and a challenge in in the uh, the migraine study world uh, is that looming placebo effect, mm -hmm. uh, and so it can be difficult to really really tease out. Uh, but sometimes the therapies are Which is so okay. effective. Again, Absolutely. if the placebo Absolutely. works for you. That's great. We there love you, that too. There you go. Right. But in some people, it's so profound how much different they feel after they participate in a trial that you have to think the therapy has something to do with it. Well, there was a wise individual who made the statement if you're having a, uh, trouble getting in control of somebody's uh, headaches, one of the best ways to get them under control is enroll them into a Absolutely. <laughs> clinical trial. There's no question um, about that. It's yeah. sick. Well, there's other parts of it. There's the sure. nurturing part of it. There's the reinforcement of dietary issues of avoiding triggers, all these things that you've already brought up. So the clinical research process is extremely helpful for a lot of people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think so. So is there anything else uh, out there that we should be aware of in terms of uh, maybe research that is not being done uh, here in Northeast Florida that we should be looking out for or other things that may be uh, a particular niche for a particular type of headache patient? We always hold the cluster headache patients uh, in a very, uh, you know, specific uh, niche, and and so, I uh, you know, um, I do think that it's, uh, you know, the cluster headache patients are always waiting for uh, additional studies to mm -hmm. come out, uh, and 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 so uh, maybe some some word or mention about, um, you know. Um, neurostimulation devices and, mm -hmm. and all, you know, those types of therapies that are not really medicines. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately it's, it's difficult for, uh, nerve stimulators and, uh, there are transcranial magnetic stimulators and, and other types mm. of therapies devices, like this, yeah. to, devices to really get uh, traction with insurance, uh, coverage. Are there any devices approved now for migraine headaches? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Can you, did you mention those quickly? Uh, sure. So um, a transcranial magnetic stimulation device. Uh, it's really? A, an an e-neuro. It, it gives a – it's it's approved for uh, both abortive therapy and prevention uh, and has, uh, you know, demonstrated efficacy is, you know – Do you wear this? You have to go to a clinic to get it or uh, – That's the problem mm -hmm. is you got to rent it uh, <laughs> okay. or, or purchase it. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, it's generally, you know, um, cost prohibitive. Mm. Uh, uh, and there are other nerve stimulation devices. Um, um, a lot of people will have heard of Cephaly, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, an, just an electric stimulation device that really can help uh, some patients. And so, uh, you know, I think as the efficacy of these sorts of things becomes increasingly, you know, more and more demonstrated, hopefully coverage will uh, be a little more reasonable. Um, you know, it's it, it's unfortunate if... if um, if I, you know, I think that the transcranial mag magnetic stimulation device uh, companies have largely um, 
kind of given up on the United States at the at the really? moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a it is a it's a safe therapy mm-hmm. and it has uh, uh, you know good uh, efficacy. Interesting. Um, and so, and that's be- they've given up on the U.S. because of payment issues, right? Well, yes. Interesting. Um, and how about narcotic avoidance? I know that's a big uh, push by the government and, and others uh, because of all the side effects of chronic narcotic use. Um, yes. Are there studies that are specifically focused on that? So first, um, if you're going to a provider and you have a migraine syndrome and what they're prescribing for you is a narcotic, mm-hmm. you should signif- I think that you should maybe seek an additional opinion. Mm. Um, narcotics are almost never appropriate for a migraine patient. Interesting. Um, narcotics really uh, don't abort migraines. Mm-hmm. Um, no, nar- I, I say, uh, in my opinion, no narcotic has ever aborted a migraine ever. Wow. Um, it may allow someone to go to sleep mm-hmm. and then sleep would have then aborted the migraine, mm. uh, but it wasn't the actual narcotic effect. Um, as a matter of fact, narcotics will uh, run a very high uh, rate of backfiring on a migraine patient mm. uh, and producing that medication rebound phenomenon. It's extremely, extremely uh, um, potent at, at actually making a migraine patient worse. Wow. Uh, and so we uh, we almost never are prescribing And that's narcotics. a big change. So when I was a medical Tremendous. resident, I used to be taught to give Demerol right. in the emergency room. That, yeah. was, that was supposed to be the best narcotic for migraine patients. Yes. Obviously, that turned out to be incorrect. It was very incorrect. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we have learned this for sure over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, and we really should be avoiding uh, narcotics because we have, you know, it's it, we're, we're, uh, we understand migraine pathophysiology a lot better now. Uh, and, and these migraine therapies are migraine-specific therapies. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are directed at the pathophysiology of migraine. Uh, and, and that's why they're so much more effective. But I understand there is still a group of patients that are being prescribed narcotics because mm-hmm. of, quote, headaches. And Certainly. That, that could be a target maybe for clinical research, I would think. Historically, um, you'll find in many, uh, most actually, uh, clinical trials that patients who are on uh, frequent doses of narcotics are going to be excluded from right. uh, from their studies. And the conventional, uh, you know, consultation, uh, you know, in terms of designing studies uh, would generally suggest that because nothing's going to work in that scenario. Right. The first thing that really needs to happen is the narcotics need to be weaned. Mm-hmm. Um, and so approaches to actually get rid of, of what's very likely an offending agent worsening a headache syndrome, mm-hmm. that's actually what needs to be done. Um, I, I, I would be surprised to find um, pharmaceuticals interested in, in studying that population. Um, because in, Unless how, it can help people get off narcotics more easily as, that's, a, as that's, an endpoint for the study. V- absolutely. Yeah. Very, very useful. Mm. Yeah. Um, in, in, it is a challenging situation. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult when, you know, the person has another pain condition that really does justify, right. uh, you know, the narcotic use. Sure. Uh, and, and so those are some of our most challenging uh, headache patients for sure. Well, thank you. Steve, this has been a fascinating conversation. It's been absolutely fabulous. I've learned a tremendous amount. Hopefully our audience will have learned as well. Thank you for being part of Med Evidence. You're welcome. Thanks for joining the MedEvidence Podcast. To learn more, head over to medevidence.com or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform.